everybody, it's Talknosis, and joining us yet again is M.R. Osborne. Uh, you've probably been like, hey, it's been a day, a week, uh, 72 minutes since Michael's been back on the show, but here's the thing, he keeps putting out amazing books, we have to keep having amazing discussions with him. Michael, welcome back to the show, and again, thanks for, for all that you're doing with all your awesome projects, so you're really doing a, a whole service to... Specifically, the modernist community, broadly, the esoteric community, the mysticism community, the Christian mysticism community. Yes, thank you, John. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, so, you know, last time we we talked about a book that that has a, that has a big reputation that there's misconceptions about, that was hard to find, it is now easier and even easier with your amazing translation, and that was the, the treatise on the reintegration. But, you know, I've been hearing about these de Grainville manuscripts, de Granville manuscripts for, for a long time now. And it's, it's the kind of thing that people talked about, but was really hard to find if you if you only spoke English. Of course, if you spoke French and had a library card in France, maybe you'd have an easier time. But can you I, I, I think the show will be fun because you, you might be able to clear up some misconceptions about these texts as well. But maybe we can just start off with what are the de Granville ma manuscripts? Why are they sometimes known as the Green Book or the Manuscript d'Alguerre? Well, look, I mean, they've been published previously. Georges Courts did his very good French transcription, as you know, a very well-regarded introduction and the like. And there's been an English version of the last few years. What I, if I can just say at the outset, what I set out to do was actually to to produce and to put out a slightly different animal, actually, to to either of those. And that was to present the original manuscript alongside an English translation. So when you open the book, I, I, I have it here. So it's not a small. It's not a small undertaking. It's very really large. But then, then again, I, I sort of set out to do the print quite large. But anyway, as an example of what I'm talking about, you've got the the image and the direct translation opposite. And there's nothing added to this. So I haven't included the, the, the an appendix of the various hieroglyphs and glyphs or names, registry of names or anything like that, because they didn't appear in de Granville's manuscript. And neither have I taken anything out either. So you also have, as part and parcel of this volume, the pages that de Granville effaced. Okay, so we crossed through a lot of his work. For whatever reason, he wasn't happy with them or they weren't accurate enough for him or, or perhaps he, he no longer had any use for them because he'd moved on a, a, a step or two. Whatever it was, they're included. So you have an exact um, tran translation of the exact manuscripts so make, makes it very fragmentary. Uh, anyway, so what you have, it's not a book, it's not a treatise, it's a journal, it, they, it's a notebook, and it happened to have been written in a green leather notebook. And for that reason, and no other reason whatsoever, it's been referred to as the green book of the L.O. Coe, and I suppose it has marketing appeal in certain quarters, because it sounds like there's an extant grimoire out there, which it is not. It's not an extant grimoire. It's a collection of prayers and operations, catechisms, notes, jottings, and some illustrations. The main thing to, to, to also point out, John, is that, you know, these notes, they weren't meant to be shared by de Granville. They were, they were his personal operative notes in a period when there were no computers, there were no email, no telephones. And he'd get his instructions from from letters and correspondence from Pasquale or else through direct instruction. So that's essentially what it is. So it's a fragmentary, incomplete, and almost perfect for its incompletion in, in this edition and sense that there's nothing, as I say, added to or subtracted from it. It is as the BNF manuscripts are. Okay, and the other thing I would say is that there's also the appendix folio of documents, illustrations, papers in this as well, which weren't in, 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 in either of those previous editions. So there's a little bit of extra in there too. Yeah. 
So he mentioned the Granfield. This is, in the, you know, just to reiterate, this is a, this is his journal. This is his diary, right? He has the book open. He's getting instruction in real time. He's making some notes. He's getting these letters. Maybe they're long and complicated. He doesn't want to keep referring back to the letters. So he's taking information from them, putting it into some sort of personal order in his, in his private, in a book that was meant just for him. But can you tell us who, who was he? Who was the Lieutenant Colonel Pierre André de Granville? And I'm just going to assume that he had a long, happy, healthy, peaceful life. But I, I suspect, John, in the, in the line of questioning, you know not. He died, unfortunately, on the guillotine in, on the day after his birthday, in January the 20th, 1794. It was about a week before the, the, the various religious were murdered as well in Angers and other places around France as the, the revolutionary state turned its guns on on on, on the religious and spiritual and, and the church and so on. They saw them as enemies of the state. So to the extent to which de Granville was wrapped up in that, whether it was because of that or because he was a lieutenant colonel retired in a, in a in a regiment which had fought for the king, perhaps he, along I suspect with most of the Edo Co in that period, remained loyal to the to the. Is another matter. A year previously, the king had been killed, of course, guillotined. This is Louis the Sixteenth. So de Granville was swept up in that, and his end wasn't particularly pleasant. As far as who he was, he was a class, he was a military officer, he ser he'd served in the Regiment de Foix, he'd served in, in Germany. The regiment, whether it was he or, 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 or others, I don't know, because it was all a manure recruiting ground, Squally, in this regiment and other French regiments, because that was where these various Masonic lodges had been established. De Granville may have seen service in Grenada. He may have seen service in South Carolina during the American Revolutionary War in support of the, the insurgency, of course. So um, regardless, he he obviously clearly was a soldier. He met Pasquale and other Elo Cohen through his connections with the Masonic fraternity within the regiment, off the class, the sort of guys that Pasquale was was really sort of aiming for for his Elu Cohen for one reason or another. So there's, and you mentioned this in passing. Also, uh, I'll mention this in the show notes. You know, we've got a lot of great shows with Michael that you, you should go back and watch. You can know more about Pasquale, more about the Elu Cohen, more about the time, more about, even though we'll get into it, some of the, the doctrines behind this book. But uh, th there's an idea, and you mentioned this in passing, and you did sort of clarify, but, but why, why don't we just hit the point home? But there's an idea that these texts are a kind of ritual guide or a grimoire. You know, is that correct? No, it's not a grimoire. As I say, it's, it's a collection of notes. It's a journal. I mean, one of the reasons why I haven't called this, for, in, for example, the manuscript of Algiers is simply because, you know, it was so cool because it was purchased at the market by a woman in 1955 or whenever it was in Algiers from a people are merchants on a marketplace. So it's a collection of papers. I, I suppose a Masonic lodge in metropolitan France had sent them there around about the Second World War for their protection. And there are, there are some interesting operational parts. There are diagrams of quarters, for instance. There's a very interesting picture of who Robert Amberlain suggests may be a, a personified um, expression of the shows in, in, in this as well, which didn't appear in earlier editions. It has been published previously, but not in the so-called manuscript of Algiers or, or the even worse green book you know in terms of its time um so it's a collection it's not a it's not an extant grimoire at all in any way shape or form and should be approached really as a collection of papers i suppose the nearest analogy i could give you if you think of the new testament i mean the new, the new testament isn't a simple single book it's it's not treaties or anything like that it's a collection of letters and 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 various didactic teachings and and hymns, and there's a biography in there and other sorts of bits and pieces. So no biography in this, but still his notes and jottings, his views on things and, and what's interesting to him. Yeah. 
So at, at earlier in the show too, you, you mentioned glyphs and hieroglyphs. So glyphs, hieroglyphs, passes, luminous symbols. What are these? Why are they important? Are they in the book? Well, people have different views on that particular subject. It depends on your experience and things of, of that nature. I mean, glyphs and hieroglyphs differ in the way that they're written or the way they're drawn, of course. They they make they take the the shape or form of uh, of, of the drawing, like crosses or snakes, as we find in in the manuscript of Algiers. To me, they're a sign of of energy. So they may be experienced in in in, in the passes that take place as a sort of crackle or energy, or or perhaps a vision of some description that that is pursuant to them. So like Taoism or or, or which has the way, or even Star Wars, which has the force. If you like, hieroglyphs sort of geared more towards a, a picture or representation of something that is that is spiritual, and we can't quite convey in human words or explain properly in human words, which is why I'm doing such a terrible job, I'm sure, right now explaining what they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, there's okay. guys, sorry, I was going to say, there are, of course, there's a there's a, a registry of names, and there and the the uh, back in the day, the great sovereign would have interpreted the the the, the glyphs and the hieroglyphs that the the operant would have actually seen, and they may have been fleeting. It could have been a moment of seconds, or it could have been longer, but there would have been this this impression. It could have been auditory, it could have been visual, or it could have been psychological, but the the, the 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 glyphs, that's the characters and the hieroglyph would have been experienced by way of the passes, and the operant would then have written to the great sovereign, that was Pasquale, for an explanation, who would then look through his his own paperwork to explain who the guide was that was actually attempting to communicate to the operant. And of course, John, that's also one of the reasons why the manuscript about Jesus and as I call it, the Granville Manuscript shouldn't actually include the registry of the 2400 names or the the various glyphs that you find in Prunel, because that sort of information is sort of reserved for a much higher degree, okay? And it was something also, as I say, that the, the great sovereign himself would then have conveyed to the operant. So this, it's quite dangerous in a way, I think, trying to tie those things up together yourself and hence and also because the Granville didn't include that additional information in his notes, he was obviously referencing it separately for that reason I haven't included them in this as well. Right, right and, and to clarify for people at home it's you know, you would be doing uh, a series, I mean, sometimes in these texts, right, you, you're talking about retreats where you're praying day and night, right, or you're doing a, an operative ritual, and then you would get a glimpse, as you said, uh, uh, maybe visually, maybe psychologically, who knows, of, of one of these glyphs, you would draw it out, you would send it to the Pasquale, he would refer to this this guide that would list all of these symbols and tell you what, what it meant or what, what was the entity that was trying to connect with you to bring you higher your spiritual evolution. And and I guess, too, when you're talking about not including that, if, if you already know those symbols, you're getting them into your unconscious, right? Like, it's probably best not to know the glyphs or the hieroglyphs. And that way, you, you'll be knowing that you're experiencing something authentic if you're on this path. Yeah, and of course, authenticity isn't the main issue. It's actually there's a risk, I think, that that an entity may be attempting to communicate that is bad. Oh, and did you? so, you know, the point of the Elu Cohen as a, as a Christian order is to contact and, and receive help and support from guardians who would be able to 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 protect and guide you on on this path of of reintegration or retracing your path back to god and so the danger of contacting something that is negative or or evil through ignorance and that's what it would be we're not talking here about the so-called false rogue wow, or anything like that we're talking about people who, who may be um having a, a a punt at these things it's potentially very dangerous and i suppose 
that there's there's the rub really yeah 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 it, well you know we've talked on previous shows that you know they have the cohen we're were warrior exorcists in a way you know that was at least a symbolism that they used and you're probably going to make some some enemies as, as a warrior exorcist or if you're attempting to be one the the the, the other day on a talk where i was actually likening the the disciples these are the 72 that were sent out 70 or 72 by christ he sent them out ahead in scenario and i'd set some bloke who who was essentially saying, you know, you're making various assumptions about the the entities there being bad and and all the rest of it. Well, you know, I, I I am approaching this from a Christian point of view, and yes, the New Testament is the sort of, if you like, the core the core document for a, for a Christian to 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 turn to. And Christ does send seventy two or seventy blokes in pairs ahead of him into Samaria before he even goes there. And one of the reasons he does that. It's because that area was known to be infested with evil entities. Now, for whatever reason, that that may have been the case. Whether it was true or not, it doesn't matter. That's what the New Testament is telling us. And so they cleanse the space. They were warrior exodus sent on the head to do the, the casting to essentially to types of miracles that these blokes are performing when they're sent on ahead of him and indeed after christ's death when the when the apostles go to Samaria to deal with simon majors and that is healing and casting out devils or demons yeah absolutely and yeah to, just to reiterate your point if, if you read the new testament that that is a, a big part of what jesus does is exorcisms yeah and <laughs> the, 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 one of his major miracles and you know especially in mark you know it just that's the it just hits that point over and over again that's what he's wandering around doing yeah you know they either exist or they don't i mean if you don't buy into this fine but if you do and and, and you believe that there are disembodied entities other life forms other than the physical in the universe i personally subscribe to that i don't care what other people think quite honestly with respect to that i know it to be the case and i also subscribe to the christian faith so for me if you like the the prototype of of, of that kind of warrior exorcist you know you could look for that in in the disciples you could look for that in 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 the scriptures so yeah it's similar stuff to that of course, the antecedent for Pasquale's order of elect priests is claimed to be much older, but it's the same. It's the same struggle. It's the same principle. So, when I've read other versions of the text, I haven't. I haven't gotten yours yet. I'm definitely looking forward to to getting a copy. But all, all of a sudden, I see a, a plus one, like literally, like a, a little plus sign and a number one or a plus eight or or other numbers, and in the middle of the prayers and rituals. What, what what does that mean? Does that mean that if I was saying this prayer, I'm supposed to say that the number plus plus one or plus what have you? That, ah, John, I know you better than that. You know. <laughs> that that's what you call a leading question. <laughs> the leading question, you know, rock off the bar. No, I mean, here's the thing. It isn't, but what you don't want to do if you're a historian or, or or approach this from an entirely academic point of view is insert that sort of information that's not what this is go and buy the other bloke's book if you want that but for me i've left it as is this is frustrating for people who don't know for those that do it's not an issue because they, they these numbers are they illustrate the power of the word or the name that you're invoking Okay, so the names will have a, a, a number attached to them. So it's a little like the, the, the hieroglyphs and glyphs we were talking about earlier, where there's actually name attached to that number. And that is what is being invoked in those prayers. So it could be, for example, a name like Vor or Vauer, okay, which has the power of 10. So it's a godly name. And these are contained, of course, in the registry of names. So, um, as with the, the glyphs and the names and the characters and things like that, essentially what you're looking at is a form of semaphore in these writings, because as, as indeed with a Masonic ritual book, I mean, if it fell into the wrong hands, there has to be a way of protecting that information, which is quite sacred and, and also unique to the particular operant as well. So in, in, in de Granville's case, in, 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 in the book, 
where he refers to those numbers. They are the particular guardians that are connected to him. They're there for him and that he's in invoking them. Or indeed, it may be God. So that's the reason for it. And that's what that's referring to. Yeah. So again, another another leading question, but I, I think some people will, will, will think that you, you've already answered this. So we talked about how the, this is not a comprehensive laid out treatise, right? It is it is a journal. It is a notebook. But but even then, because as you said, there is operative stuff in it. You know, can I can I sit down and extract this operative material and accurately recreate and perform the original Edo Khan theurgic rituals? You know, in in short, no. There are things in it that include prayers and invocations, but of course the method and technique to get there isn't included. I mean, by way of example, you know, there's more than half an hour's work at the equinox before you can even get to the equinoctial operation, isn't there? And that's in there. So you have, you have, if you like, snippets would be the way to look at it. And it may be the meat, meat and bones in this, but it's not the the whole, the whole thing. And of course, this is a mistake as well that Amberley made in reconstituting the order. Pappas did it earlier for him. The whole thing was essentially where they had these large gaps. They 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 made them up, and 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 so there's a a lot of the stuff in this is unrecognisable to an Amberley modern Cohen. They won't recognise a lot of the things that are in this because this is original workings that said pasquale and co were constantly revising their workings anyway because accuracy was essentially important to them right right and do you think it's you know you mentioned some dangers but you know is it is it Wise or prudent or helpful for someone's spiritual path to try to recreate the Halo Cohen, perform the rites and surgery as close to as possible to the original as we can get. And maybe that's a dabbler, as you mentioned. You know, you mentioned maybe somebody just having a lark or or trying that might be dangerous. But what if what if someone goes, you know, tries really hard? What if they put together a a group of Halo Cohen aspirants and they they're going to go back to this and the other material we have and really try to work the rituals as much as as much as possible, as close to the 18th century as they could get. Like, do you think that that is a, a, a good thing to try, wise, prudent, healthy for spiritual development? Well, the thing about the 18th century compared to today is that all of these people that were joining Freemasonry in France at that time and the, and the Elo Cohen as a, another order beyond that were well-versed in the Christian faith. They had the exoteric support of the external church to rely on. So they knew the difference between good and evil, and they knew who their God was. Nowadays, we, we're lacking that. So this is, this is a whole new era as we move into this new era. It hasn't even got going yet, but it's one where Christianity is now essentially very much in decline and i think that cannot be denied okay so to answer your question if you could get a bunch of blokes together who were grounded and had the foundation in the exoteric side of things because one without the other is in balance okay if you were then to have that I think it would be a laudable exercise, provided, A, it was any changes, and, and indeed what was used was thoroughly researched and changed where a persuasive argument could be made for its improvement because another document has come along. And I think the if you could avoid the temptation to pad the gaps, as, as, as Anne Boleyn and Pappas did, then I think it would be a, a laudable thing to do we could refer to it as the pasquale lineage or pasquale stream as opposed to for example the amberlain stream or the or the pappas straight i mean pappas for example converted mark into a masonic order it was never that before that point that wasn't what san Matan was about didn't do that so 
Yes, I think it's it's possible. And I think the danger element would be mitigate with the right. It's always the way. It's the right. This is why, of course, Pasquale was recruiting from um, the types of guys he was. For instance, in the military, I mean, that they, they were largely fearless and they'd had military experience. They'd seen death staring them in the face. And if that's the case, they're less scared. They're less terrified about the demonic. Because they've seen some pretty bad stuff in this world anyway. So they were tougher. And we'd lack, well, nowadays, I think, or meant most of us would. So it might be something, a system that is not appropriate for this day and age now. I don't know. But I suppose if you could get the right people together, then yes, it would be a good experiment. That'd probably be very profitable. Yeah. Well, in some of our previous shows, you know, we talked about how the, the marginalist myth and mysticism can be compatible with Catholicism and really lots of forms of Christianity and churches. But but what about this act of theurgy? It's, is, is it compatible? Would it be compatible with, with Catholicism? You mentioned the, the exterior church, but I, I could just see a lot of people, and not just Catholics, but, but a lot of people in mainline mainstream churches being you know, really thinking at these these sometimes weird rituals and names and glyphs. Well, that 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 can't be compatible with our our nine to five day to day church life. Look, I mean, you've read my books. You know that my drift and the approach I'm taking is to bring back the sense and core essence of the original Elie Cohen, as it was in 18th century France, with its felicity. Now. It's true that the exoteric church would reject the the Elie Cohen and would regard it as not compatible with it. But you have to remember uh, the fact that the, the exoteric church has its agenda, has questions of authority, it has claims of authority. And it also claims, a, it claims a, an exclusive control over the theurgy it practices right there cannot be anything more than the original latin mass and the epic thesis in east and western traditions whichever denomination you are if it's a catholic small church the, the theology or ecclesiology i should say is it's the simple highlight of theurgy it's a belief that the the, the elements that are being used, as in the Last Supper, the bread and the wine, become the actual body and blood of Christ, either in totality with the appearance of bread and wine, or perhaps with his real presence, depending on your view on things. So the Catholic Church would be, in, in a sense, I think, hypocritical in attacking the Elo Cohen. Except for the fact that the Eno Cohen are not in competition with it. They're not about that. They're not interested in interfering with the sacramental life of the church or its authority. Which is why you have the Abbe Fournier, who, who to his, into his late 80s, he kept his tonsured hairstyle. He remained a Catholic priest. He was also an Eno Cohen and had almost 80 visitations from Pasquale's disembodied spirit amongst others. And we'll never know what this last second volume would have to say about the operational side of things and why he didn't publish it, I suspect, is because of the conflict it placed him in with the church. And yet, Fournier remains quite adamant that the, the apostolic succession and the authority of the church should be adhered to at all times. And the reason is, the Yellow Cohen are not in competition with it. They are a hidden church. They are running alongside it. It's a separate priesthood with a separate pedigree and a separate succession and lineage, but it is not in any way incompatible and it is not in any way attempting to harm or undermine the church and its authority and teachings on an exoteric level. It is simply saying that, you know, you can, you can sit on a pew. You can't become a priest in the Roman Catholic Church um, if you're a woman. You can't become a priest in the Catholic Church if you 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 have a, any other sort of necessary impediment that might get in the way, or they don't select you, for example. And the same is true in the Elo Cohen, the sense that it will select its priests. But the point about priesthood is the direct contact and the mediacy of your relationship 
with, if you like, the, the, the theurgical side of things. So in the Catholic Church, a priest, I mean, you're a deacon in, in, a, in an Gnostic church, so you'll be familiar with the concepts of the epiclesis. So the point is, it's your proximity to that mystery and that, that power, that energy transformation. And you're not going to get that necessarily sitting in the pew at the back of the church week in, week out, the rest of your life. And you may do. And we do consume these elements, of course, and and, and in a sense it becomes part of us. But the, I think the point of the Elu Cohen would be the the sense of, of proximity to God wouldn't get in the exoteric faith. And it's not in competition with it. They're both working together in preparation for the end times, you know, the return of Christ, all that sort of thing. And in order to do that, you've got to cleanse the ground, a bit like Jesus sending out his apostles into Samaria ahead of them, or the exorcism that goes on in the Yellow Cohen to clear the space so that these influences and intellectual, if you like, thought processes that impede our own independence are cleared. And if that's not doing the work of God and working hand in hand with the exoteric church, I don't know what is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I concur. So the, the book will appeal to those of an academic and historical bent. But but do you think it'll be insightful to read for spiritual reasons, like even if you're not trying to, quote unquote, do any Elu Cohen workings? Well, it's going to be of interest to people who are, who are Pasquale lineage. I suspect that a lot of the, the Amberlane string guys that bought, for instance, the, the previous English version would have been disappointed with it because they wouldn't recognise so much that's in it. And, you know, I mean, back in the 1940s or whenever it was when the order was sort of resurrected from its previous incarnation just prior to the First World War, and that again, some, what is it, 120-odd years after the order was officially disbanded, well, Assas in 1780. So I think the, the Ambalin, sorry, the, the Pasquale lineage guys and historians may be very interested in it. It's not something you can pick up and and, 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 and use as a say as a grimoire. Looking at this, you're thinking, that's got to be a complete grimoire. Come on, come on, that's got to have everything in it. It doesn't. It, 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 it has what this what bloke, de Granville, was writing down and trying to commit to memory because he didn't have an iPhone back then. So he was jotting things down in his little green scrapbook and notebook and crossing through things. And a lot of stuff in this, which is crossed through, that's of interest to people. That's of in scholarly lineage. It may be interest to people of the modern version of the Yellow Cohen who, who were perhaps quite interested in, in, in some attempt to, to peel back those years and try and get back to what Pasquale was actually doing but no I, I you know I think essentially what you need to understand is this book isn't sensationalist mm -hmm. it have that sort of information in it and somebody somewhere could probably pull all these different threads together and and come up with something okay thus far it hasn't been done successfully or very well yeah so I guess it's it's time sort of wrapping up, but uh, you know you're quite prolific, as I said at the beginning of the show. I'm really glad you are. I, I hope I hope there's more texts coming, but at the same time, there, there's only so many hours in the day, right? You're also not only translating, but writing your your own books. So what what do you find personally powerful and interesting about about this book, especially compared to some of the ar other martialist texts that you've you've worked on and translated and presented? But I'm also holding down a full time job as well. Jamie. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. And and a life outside of both of those things. So yeah, working helps in that regard because you can sort of find the time to do both by extending your day. I mean, it's just it's one of the the advantages of it, really. You know, doing the, the real work at midnight and and some research or speaking to people you need to speak to during the day, particularly important when you're trying to get in touch with BNF, for instance. Yeah, uh, and to contact them at lunchtime, whatever you do. So. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's an it's an energy motivated by an interest. What I'm trying to do, if you haven't noticed by now, is I am trying to put the core Cohen manuscripts in new English accessible translations as paperbacks and 
as hardbacks like this to create if you like a sort of pedia britannica or the yellow cohen so that we have these things there that are actual real books rather than something you can get on a pdf or 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 or, or through called lulu or something like that so it's something that'll last so insofar as the the other works are concerned they each have they all have their own particular emphasis and message to give the lessons of leon minutes of meetings where these guys got together to discuss certain topics and that's it's early order stuff it's like the lower grade sort of if you like general doctrine that's covered by that with pasquale's treaties you have his sort of great sort of commentary on jet buying that in with with some of the more operational parts it's not just the an exegesis of scripture as you know but it is largely setting out where he is on that fascinating mammoth work but very satisfying and with fournier you have this gentle concern with first of all the sort of if you like thomist view that you should accept god at, at face value so he's concerned with fighting the deists He's concerned, concerned with the atheists, he's concerned with the mockery that takes place. And this was back then. I mean, he'd have a field now, what's going So he's concerned about that authority, and he's trying to sort of emphasise the Christian groundwork, the essentially Catholic groundwork that underpins all of these mysteries and the esoteric tradition. By all means, be interested in somnambulism of, of Lesnar and, and, and Swedenborg and and by all means discover who your guardian spirits are so that they can help guide and protect you by all means do these things and there's a reason why um, saint martin survived the french revolution and fournier lived so long and survived it as well they're protected by something or someone but underpinning it all is this core foundation that you need to have and that's fournier's message you know to love god and to be moral with it and then you've got the de granville manuscripts like i say they weren't intended for publication it's not a treatise it's a bloke's journal it's his scrapbook as he's writing these things down it just happens to contain some very profound and very interesting information for us and again like with the other uh, books you see into the mind of the people that are writing them okay so you see the world through their eyes and I think that's that's the the what I get most from from this particular book. It's a sense of de Granville as a very strong person, but also someone with great unbounded enthusiasm and energy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's a, a great place to wrap up. Uh, for those watching at home, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen we have RoseCircleBooks.com, so you can go there and you can buy this book and the other books that Michael has both translated and wrote you can also find them on amazon and i'm sure wherever books are sold online uh, you can help us do the show by patreon.com slash gnostic that's recurring donations every month we don't some patreons give you something for helping us do the show but you get the satisfaction of keeping the show alive we try to send you the shows early we often forget but we're going to get better about that we are working on giving our patrons something but what a lot of other podcasts do and i'm not blaming them they they, they record extra shows and they put them behind the table we, we don't want to do that right so we whatever we do we want it to be public so that people can access all this great knowledge that our, our guests bless us with so you can also do one-time shows at paypal.me slash dos yeah the, 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 michael i'm sure we'll be talking to you again soon but again thanks so much for coming on the show it, it, it's been fascinating and i can't wait to get my copy of this tech thank you i hope you enjoyed it oh very much so okay bye